Take your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2, very familiar passages around the holiday season, things that we've uh, looked at every year for virtually all of our lives. If you know the Lord, grew up in a Christian home environment. But there's just so much to be reminded of and how God works in our lives and he brings that hope to us. Uh, it always seems like uh, when Christmas rolls around, it's, it's a great and it's a blessed time, but it's always a time when I seem to need a little bit more hope. Uh, I need to be reminded of the hope that God gives us and the encouragement that he bestows upon us and, uh, and all that he's provided for us. And so as we look this morning at Luke chapter number two, uh, we're going to look just at the first seven verses this morning as we begin. Uh, and as we continue with our thoughts this morning on Jesus uh, Messiah. And so Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. I want to speak this morning as we continue our series on Jesus Messiah on this thought, the provision of the Messiah. The Messiah provided. And let's pray. Fathers, we again begin the message this morning. I pray as we've opened your word that you would bless it and that you would help us to open our hearts, Lord, to you as you speak to us. When I pray that you'd help us to focus now on your word and allow your word to focus on us. Uh, Lord, work in our hearts, we pray in, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so last week as we began, excuse me, we talked about looking at Jesus Messiah and the promise of the Messiah. That God came from uh, this, the Garden of Eden and began immediately to, uh, at the fall of man to offer a solution to the sin problem. A remedy, a ransom that would be provided. And so we looked... Last week at the, the term Messiah meaning the anointed one, uh, specifically a prince, the king of Israel, and the high priest, the final high priest of Israel. And so we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we describe him as prophet, priest, and king. Uh, the Bible clearly shows him fulfilling all of those roles. Uh, and we looked at that promise of Messiah uh, that was given, that God would give the one that he selected, that he chose. Uh, he prophesied in many accounts how his birth would unfold, where it would take place, uh, and so many different aspects. And we looked at many of those last week. We also looked at the New Testament equivalent to the, to the title Messiah, uh, is the word and the, the title Christ. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, uh, we think of that in terms and context often of our own culture, uh, meaning that when we hear that Jesus Christ, we simply think of a first name and a last name. Uh, and so, but the reality is, is that he is Jesus the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. Uh, and it is a title, the anointed and, and Christ meaning specifically anointed, the Messiah, uh, and more specifically the Son of God. And so he, he identifies fully for us in his name uh, and in his title exactly who he is. He was told, they were told, Joseph and Mary, to name him Jesus. The name Jesus, and you'll see it there as we looked at it last week in all capitals as the, uh, as the King James translators put it out. When you see Lord in all caps or Jesus in all caps or Christ in all caps, it means specifically Jehovah. Jehovah, the highest name of Almighty God. And, uh, and Jesus in, uh, in this context is in all caps, meaning uh, Jehovah is salvation. There is no question that God is our Savior, that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, there is no 
There is no uh, lacking of anything that was necessary in power and passion and uh, in person for Jesus Christ to be our God and our Savior. He is creator uh, and he is restorer. He also said that he'll be called Emmanuel. It was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah, meaning God with us. And so when you stop and you think about this, Jesus, Jehovah is our salvation and God is with us in the person and the form of the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, uh, then we have great hope knowing that the very God that created all that is, is the same God that has loved us enough to come and to forgive our sins and to restore us uh, to the position uh, of a child of God. Not just merely the creation of God, but God's blessed children. And so it is the promise of Messiah uh, that we saw last week. And we saw that because of the sin of mankind, because of our inability uh, to save ourselves, our inability to be good enough, our inability to live righteously, no matter how hard we try, no matter how determined we are, uh, we, we, it was necessary for Messiah to come to pay our sin debt and to, to do what we could not do for ourselves. We saw that that was a noteworthy promise. The promised Messiah was extraordinary. It was noteworthy in the fact uh, that it was miraculous in nature. It was noteworthy that he was born of a virgin. Without the virgin birth, there could be no salvation this morning. Uh, if you say, well, I believe that Jesus is a great prophet and that Jesus is a great uh, priest, but I don't believe in the virgin birth, and he can't be your savior because if he's not born of a virgin, that he is not worthy to be the sacrifice for sin. It was completely necessary for the miraculous nature of his virgin birth to happen the way that it was that it happened and unfolded in the scripture because without it he would have had to die and pay for his own sin nature that was passed down from his father Adam but he is that second Adam he did not have a natural human father he was conceived supernaturally miraculously by the Holy Spirit of God. He has a human mother, but no sin nature, uh, making him 100% God and yet 100% man. Uh, a perfect representative uh, to live and to, uh, to bear upon himself the penalty of our sins so that God's wrath, mercy, justice, all could be satisfied, demonstrated, and fulfilled, and we could be atoned. It was noteworthy promise. It was a never-ending promise. I'm glad this morning that the promise that he gave us in Messiah wasn't one that was only to last for as long as I dotted my I's and crossed my T's. It didn't last as, as long as, as I could be good or I could maintain a, uh, a worthy lifestyle. It was the, a never ending promise. My friends, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the life he's promised you is not a temporary life or a life that depends upon you to do a number of things to maintain it. It is a promise, the life that was given uh, that was that was extraordinary and that was eternal in nature. It will never end. If you've been born into the family of God, you will forever be a child of God. No one can change that. No one can take that away from you. God himself could not change that if he decided to because he cannot lie. And if he were to do that, he would make himself a liar. When we look and understand that uh, the, the promise that God gave us for Messiah was important. It was necessary and it had to be unfolded exactly the way that he promised it and it was. This morning we look at the provision of the promise. It's one thing to promise something, it's another thing to fulfill the promise. When we talk about the word provision, a lot of times we think of it in just the sense of uh, of making sure something can carry on. Now, we've got provisions. We've got groceries in the counter. We've got uh, electricity. We've got supplies. We've got, but it means not only that aspect, but it is the act of providing and making previous preparation for. So when we talk about the act of God and providing the Messiah is that he made uh, previous preparation. In other words, he was orchestrating all of the, uh, the acts of mankind to bring about all that was necessary for the birth to unfold the way that it was ordained and foretold by the prophets 
in the Old Testament. And so uh, we're going to look at that aspect of this the, and the birth of Christ that way this morning. The act of providing and making previous preparation. We see that demonstrated <coughs> as we look uh, this morning as he says that uh, God's providence, or we see God's providence on full display as he's orchestrating these things. And we see it here. It says here, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus had absolutely no desire in helping God fulfill his promise to humanity. He was a corrupt pagan leader. He was not someone that cared the least about the spiritual well-being of God's people and uh, what God needed to do. But yet it was necessary for him to orchestrate this so that Jesus and Joseph and Mary would leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem in time for the birth. You see, the prophets had told us that Jesus would come from, that Messiah would come from Bethlehem. They also told us that he would have to be in Nazareth. And we don't have time this morning to go through every prophecy here. Uh, but notice in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, uh, as Jesus' birth is foretold, But thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is going to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. In other words, it's ascribing here the everlasting, eternal nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not come into existence when he was born of Mary in Bethlehem. He always has existed. He is God. He simply put on human flesh at the moment of, uh, of, of the conception and, as, and his birth. And so Caesar's decree ensured that Joseph and Mary would be in the right place at the right time for the prophecy to be fulfilled. And you stop and you think about what that meant for them. At being that ready to deliver a child and having to climb on the back of a donkey and ride all the way from Nazareth down uh, to Bethlehem. And so it was not a convenient thing, but it was a, it was a commanded thing. They ha had not here just only the taxation, but it was the census. And they were required not to fill out a form uh, and send it in by email, but to go to the place of their birth. If we uh, were to do things that way today, then all of us last year would have at some point had to go uh, back to the city of our birth with our families to be counted and to be registered. That was the process that they had in place here. And so that uh, was necessary for uh, them to know. God didn't come. God came to them and said, hey, uh, Mary, you're going to conceive a child. And Joseph, this thing is of the Holy Ghost. And you're going to name him Jesus. And he'll be called Emmanuel. And he's going to save his people from his sins. But he didn't say on this date, get up and leave Nazareth and go to Bethlehem. He just worked in the affairs of man to ensure that his plan came to fruition. My friends, God's still doing the very same thing in our lives today. Uh, there's not anything left to be fulfilled in the scripture that will not in God's time be fulfilled regardless of our faithfulness or lack thereof. God's will will be done. God's work will take place. And so when we look at how God worked here and his providence was working behind the scenes, this decree came from Rome that required them at this moment. Listen, if it was, if it was any of us, we would have said, well, this is an inconvenient time. There must be some kind of an exception. If there would have been uh, an alternative way to go, no, no one would put their, uh, their, their wife uh, ready to deliver a child within days on the back of an animal and ride it uh, however many miles it was from Nazareth to, uh, for, to Bethlehem uh, and to, to deal with that burden when everything was so crowded and there was no guarantee that there would even be a place to stay. They didn't have a choice, but it was the will of God. And sometimes we want to think about the will of God, the grace of God, the love of God is making everything easy for us. But we have to understand that, that God is working in the affairs of man, whether man's cooperating or not. And whether life is easy or not. Uh, we need a savior, not because life is so great and wonderful and easy, but because sin is miserable and a destroyer of all that's good. And Jesus is the one that can rectify that. And so he was moved to Bethlehem for birth. God provided a suitable birthplace. 
Now, it's not suitable in our, in our estimation. None of us would look at this and say this was, an, uh, was a suitable birthplace. And I, well, I will say this morning, it's not an ideal birthplace. But it was suitable. It was shelter. It put him in a place where he needed to be uh, that made it easy for the shepherds to find him, that, that prophecies could, those prophecies could be fulfilled. God is just working. They come and they get there. Imagine the disappointment and the, uh, and the despair, the anguish of heart. There's no place for us to stay. There's, there's not a room for us. And the baby's coming. And they ended up in a stable. And they ended up having to take uh, an infant child and, uh, and to lay him in uh, a, an animal, a feeding trough, in order to, to use for a crib. They had to wrap him in swaddling clothes, sim symbolizing the death that he would suffer and that he would die. He, he didn't even have proper uh, a, a attire uh, to, to be placed on him and to be cared for. He had, they made do with what they had, but God provided everything that he needed them to have in the moment that all of his will would be accomplished. It was a suitable birthplace. It was shelter from the cold. It was shelter from the wind and the rain <coughs> and all that uh, possibly could have come upon them. And it it was a place where uh, it, he demonstrated the humility uh, of, uh, of the hum and the humbleness of a Savior that came not to, in this moment, glorify self, but to pay the debt of man's sin. His time to be glorified would come and will come. But he's come now in humility to be man's sacrifice. And God is working. God's work ensured that every prophecy was fulfilled. And we could spend literally weeks going through the prophecies that, uh, that interlace here from the Old Testament. Uh, but listen, uh, it, it, Pastor, does it really matter that all of them were fulfilled? Yes, if one would have failed to be fulfilled, then God is a liar and is untrustworthy. Every single thing that God said would happen happened exactly the way that God said that it would happen. Regardless of the amount of time lapse that took place be between it being told. That just makes it all the more miraculous. Uh, some prophet didn't watch Joseph and Mary leave Nazareth and head to Bethlehem and say, Hey, uh, Bethlehem, the, the king's coming from you. It was hundreds of years in advance. And God prophesied. So we're going to look at the fulfillment of, uh, of this and, and what it means to have the promise of Messiah provided to us. We see him provided here. He's no longer just a promise. There's no longer the threat of a, of a miscarriage or of a stillbirth, which would have been heavy on the mind uh, of all people that lived in this time. It was not, but childbirth was, uh, is not an easy thing today, but it was even more precarious in those times. And you look and you see what happens as they went there to be taxed in verse 4. And Joseph uh, went also up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Again, signifying that Jesus is the rightful heir to David's throne. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Listen, Jesus' birth was fulfilled. He's no longer, the, there's no longer the hope that Messiah will come. Messiah is here. There's no longer, this is what God said will happen. God has done now what he said he would do. And because God has done here what he said he would do in such a miraculous nature, I can trust and believe today that God will continue to do what he said that he will do. Messiah, first of all, this morning we see fulfilled the words of the prophets. He fulfilled them. He, he wasn't just as we looked last week, there was this promise and, and the angel came and proclaimed, Mary, you're going to have this child. Uh, this child is going to be a miracle. He's going to be conceived of God. And Joseph, don't be afraid to take your wife, uh, Mary, but uh, love her and father this child. And, uh, and you've been chosen and you've been favored and you are uh, you are a have a special place in, uh, in the history of, of eternity. Uh, and so as he, he lays all that out, it's just a, still a promise. 
But on this day, it's no longer a promise. It's fulfilled. On this day, it is fact. And in doing so, he fulfilled the words of the prophets. So we see, uh, again, we looked at this briefly last week, and so we'll not linger here this morning, but Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, he says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, or God with us. God with mankind. The, we see here the fulfillment of the prophecy of a supernatural birth. <clears throat> and listen, that cannot be overemphasized. If this was a normal, natural birth, again, there's no salvation for us today. It was supernatural. The second thing that we see fulfilled here is the prophecy of an incarnate Savior. That it was not just God manifesting himself, but it was God actually putting on human flesh. He actually became man. John in chapter 1 tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He identifies who the word was. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It wasn't just a, a child that someone put a title to. It was God uh, as uh, putting on human flesh and becoming man for our benefit. In Jeremiah chapter 23 in verses 5 and 6, uh, it says, and we'll back up to verse 4, And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called, again, in all caps, and this is Jehovah God, the Lord our righteousness. He has identified that this is the fulfillment of the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ coming incarnate in human flesh, a man, but God. Prophets fulfilled. We see the prophecy of his incarnation, the prophecy of his supernatural birth, and the prophecy of full salvation for humankind. God did not just come and say, I'm going to save you from your sin, and, uh, and then you've got to bear your, and make your way through life without me. He said, I, I'm saving you completely from the curse of your sin. Though we still bear the effects of that on this earth, the days coming where we will be liberated from even the curse of sin upon the earth when we come into the presence of our Savior. The penalty for our sin has been delivered and can be received if we'll put our faith and trust in Christ. And the power of that sin can be lifted from us as we live and walk with the Spirit of God throughout our lives and, and, and shed the shackles of those sin. In Psalm 37, in verse 39, he says, But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Listen, child of God, this morning, you are not lacking the power and the strength and the courage that you need to face the troubles that come in your life. God has provided that to you. Uh, when you feel weak and overwhelmed, Psalm 55, 22 tells us, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. We are not without resource this morning. We are not without uh, the help and the power and the presence of God uh, in our life. The salvation was not, hey, I'm coming and I'm going to lift you from the trouble of your, uh, of the penalty of your sin uh, and I'll see you later uh, when you get to heaven. No, he's right here with us every step of the way. Psalm 140 and verse uh, number 12 and 13 says, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor, surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. And my friends, this morning, no matter what you're going through, God is, you are in the presence of Almighty God. He loves you. He cares for you. And Messiah fulfilled the words of the prophets when he gave us a Savior that was born supernaturally. When he put God, when God came and took upon himself uh, human flesh and became uh, in the form and the fashion of a man. And the prophecy of full salvation. I'm glad this morning that I'm on my way to heaven. But I'm also glad that I have a Savior that walks with me every step of the way. Amen. We see in the 
Messiah fulfilling, first of all, the words of the prophets, but then secondly, this morning, Messiah also fulfilled the work of the high priest. Why did he come? He came to save his people from their sins. And in order for us to be saved from our sins, atonement for our sin had to be made by an acceptable sacrifice to God. Not just any sacrifice would do. Not just any offering that was lifted up would, uh, would satisfy the holiness and the righteousness of God. It required a special sacrifice. It required a, a special high priest. And we see in Jesus Christ the fulfillment of the work of the high priest in Hebrews chapter number 9. Uh, in verses 11 and 12, and there are several passages in, in Hebrews that say that he is a high priest after the order uh, of Melchizedek. But in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, it is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And what we see is, is he takes on his role as priest. As that the high priest of Israel to show the coming Messiah and what God would do when, he, when Jesus was offered on the cross. Uh, formed this, the tabernacle and then the temple with a courtyard where sacrifice would be made. And then uh, an altar where uh, the sacrifice would be laid and offered to God. And the blood would be uh, sprinkled for daily sacrifices. And then uh, a labor to wash and to cleanse. And then a holy place where God's provision was promised and showed and demonstrated by the table of showbread and, uh, and that was changed out in the power of the Spirit of God with the oil that was placed upon top of the showbread and then the, to the left the, the lampstand that was there that showed God's eternal light and how He's the light of the world and then the altar of incense before the curtain leading into the Holy of Holies where, uh, where the incense would offer and show the prayers of God's people rising up and spilling over the curtain into the Holy of Holies showing our prayers going to God and the high priest on one day a year would go into the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat of God uh, and he would take the atonement sacrifice and he would go in and he would sprinkle that blood and atonement for the sin of mankind for another year and the work of the high priest the only man who could enter the only one that could go into that most holy of places to offer that atonement sacrifice and to sprinkle that blood on behalf of mankind to appease God for the next year until Messiah came that Jesus said I am the sacrifice it is my blood that is worthy and offerable to God and I am the high priest I am the only one that's worthy to take the sacrifice and bring it to the presence of God and he entered into the holiest place and he offered his own blood and sacrifice that God's wrath was satisfied and justice was served and mercy was bestowed upon that final mercy seat as God looked down from heaven and said this is my beloved Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He's offered himself from you. He sacrificed himself for you. He is the great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Messiah fulfilled the work of the high priest. It's not lacking anymore. Amen. It's done. He offered an acceptable sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 9 Still in, uh, in verses 23 uh, through 28, which we've, uh, which we've looked at, we see uh, as he, or, or we looked at the verses preceding, he continues in verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but with the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, not, nor yet <clears throat> that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, 
And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. My friends, this morning Jesus Christ has offered an acceptable sacrifice because he was an able servant. He was the only one who was able. He was the only one who was worthy. He was the only one <clears throat> that could satisfy uh, the, the wrath and the work of God. I'm glad this morning that that virgin born baby grew to be the savior of humanity. Amen. We have a newborn in our house right now. And he's just eight days old today. It's hard to hold that little helpless child and to see a man. It's hard to hold that little infant and to see strength. It's hard to hold them and see any kind of power. His two-year-old brother, you can see a little power. He slings something across the room. Uh, he's still just a child, and it's not as if a man was throwing it, but you can see uh, the potential uh, that's there with the older sibling. But you can't see it in the weak old baby. And as this week old, as this days old and week old baby Jesus laid in the manger, it's hard to look and to fathom and see that this is Almighty God. He may have seemed helpless, but he wasn't. And he was right there in that precious infant state for you and for me. And as the scripture records it, he became that acceptable sacrifice. And he grew up and he gained in skill and knowledge and he walked with the spirit and, and he was empowered by God even though he was God. And he bore upon himself our sin, an able servant, because he was an authentic savior. He wasn't an imposter. We like things to be authenticated. We like to know that they're real, that they're genuine. We, we like to know that things are proven and that, uh, that they're not put on. <coughs> if you <coughs> go and you find and purchase something of value, especially if it's historical in nature, you want to know that it's been authenticated. My friends, there is no greater God than Jesus Christ. He is the only true and living God and he is authentic. He is not put on. He is not a figment of our imagination. He is not uh, some myth or some fable of years gone by. He is the true and living God. Yeah. An authentic Savior. In John, uh, John's Gospel, in chapter number 20, we see that this authentic Savior has demonstrated for us His love for us and His power for us. And in John chapter 20 and verses 25 through uh, 28, he says, and when he had so said, he showed unto them with his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me. Even so send I you. And when he had thus said, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus was not with them. When Jesus came and the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. I think this morning. If he were to just show up in the middle of the room and materialize right here without walking through a door, uh, it would be good comforting words for all of us to hear him say, peace be unto you. And he says to them, peace be unto you. Then said he unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, and reach hither <clears throat> thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Notice the response of Thomas. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. My friends, this morning the Lord Jesus Christ, that little baby in the manger, is not only a virgin born child, and he not only is the son of Joseph and Mary, the carpenter, the son of God, in whom God was well pleased, and the working high priest that offered himself a sacrifice, and the one that shed his blood, he is our Lord and our God. Second Peter chapter number one and verses number 16 uh, and 17. 
2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, uh, Peter says this, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses to his majesty. This is Peter testifying of his eyewitnessing uh, account of the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ when he revealed and showed himself in his glory. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. And the point being this morning that he has been authenticated by his disciples, by the apostles, by the word of God. And he has been authenticated by, the God, or by our father in heaven. There's no greater authenticating power than the father. This is my son. I am well pleased. Messiah fulfilled the work of the high priest. Our sin has been paid for. Atonement has been made. God has authenticated and put a stamp of approval on the sacrifice and on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The words of the prophets have been foretold. Thirdly and lastly this morning, we see that Messiah fulfilled the wealth of the potentate. The wealth of the potentate. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15. We see Jesus described here as that potentate. First Kings or First Timothy 5 <clears throat> 16 said, or let's back up to verse number 14. That thou shalt keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate the King of kings and Lord of lords who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach into whom no man hath seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That potentate, that high and honorable prince and king, that one that is above all others, that one who demonstrates the wealth and the power of all of eternity. And we think about wealth, we tend to think about money. We think that we tend to think about uh, possessions and things acquired and uh, uh, retirement accounts and things of that nature. But wealth simply means an abundance. He has an abundance of it all. There's not anything that he's lacking. There's no bill that he can't pay. There's no problem that he can't solve. And we see him demonstrate and tell us here uh, that, that he has the wealth of power. And we see him testify to the wealth of his power in Revelation in chapter 1 and verse 8. When he comes to the apostle John, the last of the apostles still living. And he gives the final book of the Bible to him as he uh, describes it. And he says to him in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. And Jesus comes and he says, I have the wealth of power. I am Almighty God. I created you. I have watched you fall and turn from me. I have loved you back to myself. I have redeemed you. I have paid sin's penalty. I have conquered death and hell. And I will make all things new. The wealth of his power. But we see beautifully demonstrated throughout the scripture the wealth of his person. You know, some people are just flesh and blood. They're kind of an empty carcass. They really don't add anything to society. They don't have anything to bring to the table. Technically, they're a human being. But in reality, they're just a breathing organism. Not Jesus. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. He is a person. And we see revealed in the wealth of his person, the concept and the principle of God being with us, of him living up to the prophesied and then the given title and name of Emmanuel. And we see that demonstrated with his abundant love. And listen, we could spend weeks on this thought. I'm just gonna make a few observations here. But by no means is it the end. We see the wealth of his person demonstrating an abundant love. That abundant love is 
found throughout the scripture. It's interwoven through every aspect of it. But it comes beautifully together in John 3.16 when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. He demonstrated his love. Romans 5.8, But God commendeth his love or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be good. He came to us when we were without hope. An abundant love. An unending love. An unexplainable love. An, un, an incomprehensible love. It'd be hard to love like Jesus. I mean, it's impossible for us to love like Jesus loved. If someone had done to us what we've done to him, we would never love them. But he loves us. It's an abundant love. We see an evident compassion and mercy throughout his, the pages of Scripture and his, his entire ministry. Oftentimes the New Testament just says that Jesus was moved with compassion. And his move with compassion wasn't just that his heart felt bad and took pity on someone. He was spurred to action. He went to them and he met the needs and he healed their diseases and he took care of their problems. And in some cases even raised them from the grave uh, to sat to to fulfill and to be the sign that he promised he would be. Why? Because he had an abundant love that was evident by his compassion and mercy. We are here this morning redeemed by a God who had mercy upon us. He demonstrated and he gave us salvation that we do not deserve, that we are unworthy of, but he had mercy upon us. He has compassion towards us. Lee Robertson, Dr. Lee Robertson used to famously say that compassion is your hurt in my heart. Your hurt this morning is in his heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has been touched and tempted in all points like as, as we are and yet without sin. He is a high priest that has been in touch with the feeling of our infirmities. He knows exactly the burdens that we bear and the heartache that we have. It is an evident compassion and then thirdly here we see in the wealth of his person and available grace. He did not leave us alone, but he extended his grace toward us. That, that unmerited favor, that uh, riches of God at the expense of his sacrifice on Calvary. And he says by grace, through faith you must be saved. For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the grace of God that saves our souls. It is the grace of God that made salvation possible. It is the grace of God that brought a little, a, a, an almighty God into the form of an innocent, helpless child. In 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. My friend, he didn't die for some, he died for all. He wants every man to be redeemed into himself. He wants everyone to partake in what he promised. And we see the wealth of his person and abundant love and evident compassion and available grace made to us if we'll put our faith and trust in him. And then we see the wealth of his people. He didn't save us just to flounder around and find our way on our own. In John chapter number 10 uh, and verse number 10, uh, as he speaks and gives the passage on the good shepherd, he says, The thief cometh not for to steal, but to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He doesn't want you to just live. He wants you to live abundantly. Not necessarily abundantly in wealth of material goods, but abundant in the, in the presence of God in your life. Abundant in his power in your life and his working in your life and his fulfilling all that he's promised within you. In Titus chapter number 3 and verses 4 uh, through 7, uh, he continues and tells us uh, this, uh, that but after that kindness and love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us uh, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
My friends, this morning we're not just an, a downcast, outcast sinner that's been left to flounder in the sin and the curse of sin upon this earth. We have a God that loved us so much that he came and he looked down in compassion and mercy. And he said, I am going to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And I'm going to put on human flesh. And I'm going to be born miraculously of a virgin so that there is no need, that there is no nature of sin. And I'm going to walk among you and I'm going to experience what you experience and I'm going to feel your pain and I'm going to heal your brokenness and I'm going to reach out to you and whenever that is fulfilled and I'm going to offer myself a sacrifice on Calvary's cross he laid down his life the Bible says no man took it from him they did not have the power to crucify him had he not offered himself a willing sacrifice on our behalf and they drove the they beat his back and they pounded his head and they pierced his brow with a crown of thorns and they uh, they put him on a cross and they spied his hands and his feet and they dropped that cross into the, a hole and they dislocated the joints of his bone and they beat him senseless until he couldn't even be recognizable as a man Isaiah tells us in chapter 53 and whenever he had borne all of that for you and God poured out all of his wrath upon him he looked up and he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost Amen. that little baby that little innocent for you and for me Three days, the world held its breath. For three days, Satan thought he had won victory. And then a stone rolled away. And life came back upon that body. And Jesus walked out of that tomb, the keys of death and hell in hand, so that what was promised was now fulfilled. So that mankind could walk and could live in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So that we could be a people that lived for him and that he could use and that he could work through to, shed his, to share his message of hope and love and compassion to a world that does not know him, to a world that will continually reject him. Listen, it is the wealth of God's people to live abundantly in the power of the Spirit of God to take the message of the gospel of Christ to a lost and a dying world that doesn't even want to hear it or understand the need that they have. To do so in a way that causes them to gain their attention and to put their focus back on the cross of Calvary, on Jesus, back to a manger, to the prophets of God, to where God can look down and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. Will you hear him this morning? Will you hear that baby cry? Will you hear that King of Kings and Lord of Lords say, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. I am Almighty God and I love you. And I want to redeem you. And if I have redeemed you, I want you to live in power in abundance. God not only promised the Messiah, he promised the Messiah, or he He. he provided the Messiah that he promised. Amen. Listen, Christmas time is a time of great hope because of what God provided. Amen. He provided a Savior. And he offers to you this morning eternal life. If you're here this morning and you're uncertain about where you'll spend eternity, may I say to you that because of what God provided in Messiah, Jesus Christ, in a manger, life eternal is available to you. You don't have to be someone that God created. You can be born into the family of God. You can accept the sacrifice. You accept the birth. My friends, if you've accepted him, you don't have to live dejected. You don't have to live downcast. You don't have to live desperate. You can live in the power of Almighty God. You can have and enjoy empowered living for, out, for your whole lifetime on this earth. Because that's what God has promised when he gave us Messiah. A Messiah that gave eternal life. And a Messiah that gave us power to live. And a, and a Messiah that gives us embracing love. If you're hurting this morning, let Jesus embrace you. If, you've, if you're broken this morning, let Jesus heal you. If there are things going on in your life that you, and the burden's too heavy and you can't bear, let him bear your burden. Let him carry it. He didn't design you to carry it on your own. He designed you to get in the yoke with him. He designed you to cast your burdens upon him so that he could sustain you. The burdens of sin is too heavy. The burdens of life are too heavy. The cruelty of this world is 
too much for us to stand strong in for long. But not when we stand with Him. We can this morning know that we're on our way to heaven. We can this morning live a life that's victorious over the power of sin in it. It doesn't mean you'll live sin free. It means sin won't dominate and control you. It means that you can live a life in which God uses you for His glory and His honor. Where God will empower you to make a difference in the lives of others. Why? Because He loves you. And He loved you enough to become man. And to allow Himself to be laid in a food trough. To be worshipped by shepherds. To have to avoid assassination attempts even as an infant. So that God could bring to bear an atonement for us. Would you accept him this morning? Christian, would you embrace the power that's available to you this morning? And would you live a life in which the Holy Spirit living through you makes a difference?